You may understand that from this beginning, I got to a certain understanding of entrepreneurship that is different from the mainstream. If you have a really great concept, it works by itself. And there's no point of financing or no point of uh, advertising and no point of management. It's the under here, and this is the Pioneer Show. The show where we talk with innovators, makers, entrepreneurs, basically people who are trailing their own trails and creating their own lives so that we all can learn how to work on our own lives. If this is your first time here, thank you for downloading and listening and I appreciate you taking the time to hear this episode. Subscribe and enjoy this conversational goodness and if you're a repeat listener, welcome back. This is episode 16 and I'm your host, Andre Dialbkerk. You can find me at It's DeAndre on Twitter and on Instagram, as well as the show at Pyre News Show on Instagram as well. In this week's episode, we have with us Gunter Falten. Gunter is an entrepreneurship and economics teacher in the Free University of Berlin, and he's also the founder of Tea Campaign, a revolutionary tea retail business of the worldwide renowned Darjeeling Tea, the most exquisite and premium tea there is. He found the company with a bunch of students, and Tea Campaign is the world leader in Darjeeling export. On top of that, he's also the author of the best-selling book, Brains vs. Capital, a fantastic book that offers a definitely refreshing view on the world of entrepreneurship. We talk about building a business, differences in roles and approaches between entrepreneurs and managers, as well as risk for entrepreneurs. I honestly cannot say how excited I am to share this episode with you, but before I do, I would like to thank Simon Hochen for the introduction. Simon is one of the organizers of an event that is going to be happening next week here in Berlin, Entrepreneurship Summit, on the 6th and 7th of October, and I strongly advise you to buy a ticket and meet both Professor Gunther and me over there. Without talking in a lot more, let's jump into the conversation with Professor Fulton. Welcome to the show, Professor Fulton. How are you? I'm fine. I'm here in Northern Thailand. Nice to talk to you. Very nice to talk to you. I must say that it's a great pleasure and even I can say honor to have you here on the Pioneers show. It's been a long time since I last talked with an author and even more an author of a book that I loved so much, Brain versus Capital in English. Uh, I think it's Wir sind versus Kapital in German. Um, yes. So... For people who don't know who you are, care to give us a presentation about yourself? Um, I'm teaching entrepreneurship for the last oh, more than 30 years. I have founded my own company. I was a business angel in many other companies. One of my students is a lot more successful than me. He runs <laughs> a company with over 600 students, uh, not students, with 600 employees. Some of them are students and yeah. Everything is well. I like the field. I love it. So, actually, this is was one of the areas that I wanted to talk eventually, but now that you mentioned, I believe, and correct me if, if I'm wrong, but I, I believe that nowadays academia is both an enabler, but at the same time a disabler of creativity and entrepreneurship. Do you, do you agree with this premise? Certainly so. I agree with that. Uh, basically, uh, university lecturing and university uh, seminars uh, are somehow oriented on the logic of a discipline, and they are not opening the eyes, uh, not opening the eyes for opportunities, for social change, for all kind of opportunities. Uh, it's more to get uh, more sophisticated in a small field be it economics or sociology or mathematics or whatever. Um, the old days when university was opening up minds and eyes, somehow I, f- I fear is gone, is a bygone era. Mm. And why do you think, uh, you already mentioned that, but why do you think that in, in a world where, for example, you said you've been teaching entrepreneurship for over 30 years, and we have a lot of people coming out of academia as startup founders. Actually, I've had a couple of different interviews for this podcast with multiple founders, successful founders, I must say, that came from the academia. Why do you think that this happens in an area that, in theory, it's so hot right now? Actually, university still is a great kind of development. So uh, even if the mainstream of university is more in lecturing and uh, kind of uh, a sphere of academe, 
uh, there are some professors and there are some insights and some debates that are excellent and outstanding. So you have to look for those people who are open-minded for social change and who are open-minded to put it into practice and to found a company. There are people, of course, and Silicon Valley is full of them. So uh, not all universities are bad. And even at universities that are more conventional, you always find some people who are excellent and are very supportive and very helpful in creating your own company. Hmm. Okay, and let me let me ask you this. So nowadays, and I'll say for at least for that last five to six years, I believe that entrepreneurship has become became very sexy. Let's call it this way. It is, of course. It is something you call it sexy. It's something very promising. It's something enlightening. I even found that most people who founded a company, um, they are becoming more lively. They are uh, personal development. It's kind of personal development. If you ask me what kind of therapy would be the best for uh, personal development, I would not send people to the psychologists. I would send them to entrepreneurship. It's a really explosion of personality and skills and everything. I even believe that people look better. They have better looks after they started a company because it's so challenging and it makes so life so full and so uh, uh, full of communications and meeting interesting people that it somehow reflects on the outer appearance of people. Hmm. Okay, I've never thought of that that way, but actually if you, if you think about usual successful founders today, they all... There, there's always this example that people give that's Elon Musk in the 1990s and Elon Musk now apparently he became younger and more well-looking than probably he was in the 1990s. Certainly so. And look at Facebook or almost everybody, uh, they develop a, a kind of, uh, of kind, a kind of personal skills that are uh, amazing, that are outstanding. So they, uh, I think pers uh, entrepreneurship is the best uh, uh, therapy for personal development. Let's put it like that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, one of the things that you mentioned is that you were you have been teaching entrepreneurship for 30 years. And I would like to tackle that with, with a specific point is that usually people, when they have to teach entrepreneurship, they have to prove that they have the so-called chops to be able to teach that, correct? Yeah, of course. Were you a founder by then? Yes, yes. I, uh, I came to the field by uh, founding my own company because I thought it is so challenging. It's so, um, it's so uh, boring, the field of economics. When I was a, a student in school, I found economics must be a great field. It must be... <laughs> something, the most exciting I ever could imagine. And then I came to university and it starts with bookkeeping and accounting and a lot of mathematics and statistics. I found it very boring and I, I became a, a speaker for the students demanding that the lectures are more lively and more uh, using practice, which is not, uh, which was not the case in Germany. I was in Harvard for a while and they teach business cases, they teach uh, from experience, from the practice, but in Germany you teach from textbooks and from very, uh, uh, very abstract theory. So I thought that must be different, there must be an approach to do it differently. And I created my own, of, uh, my own kind of entrepreneurship education. So what are the pillars of that entrepreneurship education that you created? What were the ideas behind those things? The idea was that if you have to manage a company, you are eaten up by the daily routines and the daily work. Uh, entrepreneurship for me is not the same as management. Management is you have to be in the company and you have to deal with all the people and their uh, um, capabilities and what they cannot and uh, all kind of uh, yeah, routines, routines. Uh, 
the point is entrepreneurship is about innovation. It's not about routines. Entrepreneurship is about thinking the incredible, thinking the new things. Management is uh, how to help people uh, get work in a repetitive way so that they are not uh, used more than they can uh, uh, be capable of. Uh, so the first thing that I learned, managing is one thing and entrepreneurship is a, a, a different thing. I would even say it is very different. It's even the opposite. For me, entrepreneurship is closer to what the artists do. They try to create something new and everything that uh, makes them uh, fall to order or following a kind of a mainstream and ordinary things. Uh, that's what artists don't like. They want to go new ways. It's the same with entrepreneurship. And management is you have to stick to well-known practices. You have uh, management can be taught easily or more easily at least than entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurship is about new ideas. Entrepreneurship is about new ways of looking at things. Entrepreneurship is to pick up latest research and combine it in a new way. So I learned that entrepreneurship is something special and management is a, a kind of thing you can, can learn. But as an entrepreneur, you have to be open to the horizon. You have to look at the horizon. As a manager, you have to look to the people around you and to the uh, um, machinery and uh, the accounting and statistics. You have not the open view to the horizon and what's going on there and what could be going on there with your own innovative ideas. Mm. But okay, that that makes a hundred percent sense in my book. But there's one question that follows up with that: is that how can an entrepreneur manage a company? So the thing is, after you create a company or create a project or whatever we might want to call it right now, from the moment you create it, if it starts to become successful, you need someone to manage it. So is the idea to outsource the managing? Yes, you need someone. The one uh, solution is a team. Some, some entrepreneurs are good managers at all, but it is not the rule. It is more the exceptions. Most people are good either in creating something new in innovation or they are good in uh, managing. I rarely uh, came across people who have both qualifications to work um, as a creative person, like an artist, and at the same time, Managing. Managing is like something like keeping order, keeping order into a complex and difficult situation. Make it in a way that uh, you keep order. And entrepreneurship is uh, running against order. Schumpeter, Josef Schumpeter says, creative destruction. So how to do the managing as an entrepreneur and as a creative person, if you uh, are not good at it or if you don't like it, Go for somebody else. Create a team where there are people who are good managers. And of course, nowadays, we have a highly uh, 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 a division of labor. We have a society of high division of labor. You can uh, use uh, components. You can outsource the accounting. You can outsource logistics. You can outsource uh, the website and web design. You can outsource a lot of things. I, I call it using components. You need not do everything on mm -hmm. your own. You need not do everything in your own company. You can use components from outside. We are in a highly, uh, 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 what is it, uh, uh, it, it kind of specialized a society. We have a lot of people who are very specialized, mm -hmm. very good in a certain field. Use them. You cannot cover all these many fields. So you have to apply division of mm -hmm. labor anyway and deploy, uh, uh, apply it for management. You need not be the manager yourself. I know a lot of founders who are not good managers at all and that is not good for the company. It would be better to say, I stay as a founder. I have to watch the horizon. New competitors coming up. New technology is coming up. And uh, that's enough to do, to do a good job. And managing 
should be done by somebody who is really good at that. Why not uh, go for people who are good managers? Why must the founder be the manager himself? I don't agree with that. It's two different, very different occupations. I understand the point. The, the main question that I have in assuming, for example, that I want to build my own startup or build my own idea. As an artist, we all know that 90% of artists don't make money. And when you create a company, I believe that usually people are not only trying to create something beautiful, but at the same time, tr something that gives them financial freedom. And I think, and this is my idea, not necessarily based on experience, but if I give the reins of the kingdom to someone else, I might lose control of the art that I created. Does that make sense? You might lose control as a manager as well. If you are not good in management, you may lose control and you may make a lot of mistakes. If you give it to somebody else, you have more space and more uh, opportunity to keep control, whether the whole company is going in your direction. But you are right. If you are giving it to a manager and he has different ideas, uh, that's not going to go well. You are the boss, but management in a way of directing people, organizing processes that can be done by somebody who is good in that without losing control. You cannot uh, be a fit. You cannot be excellent in all fields. Even accounting is a huge field. Usually you are not good in all points of accounting. You have to have somebody who tells you, mm -hmm. how can I control those people who are in charge for accounting? But if you do it yourself, the mistakes that you are doing may be more costly than uh, the few stamps that the accountant takes away or so. Of course, there is, yeah, there is a problem. Division of labor, delegation always has the point of how can I be in control if I delegate some work? But you have to, you cannot do everything on your own. You will not be good. You have to delegate, you have to use components, you have to outsource, and you have to find a way to have that kind of knowledge that you need for controlling. And components, if you use components, mm. usually you go for professional people, professional. If you delegate the, or you use components, the keyword is professional, be professional. Those people who are professional, they know that they risk their career, they will not cheat you easily. They will give you the knowledge how to keep the oversight. And most important for me, entrepreneurship is working on an idea, working on a concept, working out an innovation. That's entrepreneurship for me. Working out Joseph Schumpeter's creative destruction. If Elon Musk is going to do bookkeeping and accounting and uh, talking to the uh, tax uh, consultant, he will not be good in re really creating good ideas. He is doing the great new ideas. He is not going into managing and he may not be good in management. He, and, and the same with the Skype people. They got uh, Eric Schmidt and, and uh, so they, you need to go for excellent managers, but do not mix up management with entrepreneurship. That's my, uh, yeah, that's my experience. And I, th I think that's a good point. Mm -hmm. uh, you are overworked. You are, you're, you're spread out too thin. I believe you're, yeah, you're, you're, you're overwhelmed by too many specific tasks so that you can do it all together and combine it in a good way. You have to apply division of labor. You have to use delegation. Without that, you end up as somebody overworked and it may even kill your company. That's a very different approach from what I what, what usually people say. And another thing and another point that I would like to touch with you is that, and this is actually something that is accustomed to, and one of the things that I wanted to touch is, for example, the idea that you have to risk to become an entrepreneur. A lot of people say, oh, you have an idea, throw it all to the wind and let's build it. Or you have to be risky and be, uh, for example, almost a Richard Branson, be risking everything. But I, but it's my belief that Richard Branson does not risk that much, probably in the beginning. But what's your opinion on risking to be an entrepreneur? Does an entrepreneur is risk averse or risk welcoming? I, I would say uh, 
to uh, to t uh, how to say to take uh, all the risk to be uh, uh, to take a risky approach is wrong. I do not agree with it. I agree that the field of entrepreneurship is a risky one. You have not a lifetime tenure as a, a state uh, employee. Uh, you are uh, in a risky field, like a mountaineer. He's in a risky field, but that does not mean that he should take great risks. If you are in a risky field and you go up the Mont Blanc or some uh, 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 Mount Everest or whatever, so this is a risky area and a risky field, but that means in uh, conclusion that you have to avoid all kinds of risks that you are aware of, because there are many risks that still will happen without uh, you uh, uh, be able to manage them. So you are in a very risky field and a mountaineer is advised well to avoid risk because it's so risky, one wrong step, and he may, may fall down. So, and it was his last risk that he took. So, the understanding is you have to manage risk, you have to be aware of risk, you have to evaluate risk. You can cross a river by jumping from one crocodile to another crocodile, and by that, get over the river. Very risky approach, I do not advise that. It will be courageous to do so. And it is better to look for a bridge or to look for a, a kind of go through the river where it is not so deep and where there are no crocodiles. Because it is risky to uh, cross the river, you should avoid all kinds of risks. Entrepreneurship is a risky field, yes, I fully agree. But that means you have to avoid risk. That is my conviction. And uh, how to do it, you have, uh, I call it proof of concept. When you create an idea, when you create a concept, uh, there are a lot of assumptions. Will the people really need my product? Will they agree on the price? Will they agree on the design? Will they agree on the way I distribute it? It's all assumptions. and. As we know, uh, often assumptions are wrong. So instead of going full risk, check the assumptions. Go out and talk to people. Would you buy my product? What is the highest price that you would accept? Uh, what is the design that you think of? How can I find a distribution system that meets your uh, convenience and demands? So this is what I advise, proof of concept. A proof, a proof of all the assumptions that are openly or hidden in your business model, in your concept. That is uh, dealing with risk, but not saying, oh, now I have an idea, I'm a great person, I will manage all that and I take all up the risks and I will stand like a monument and even if I fail, I will stand up again. That is very American thinking. It's not so much European thinking. It goes, goes well in Silicon Valley, but it does not go so well in Europe. We have a different culture. And yes, it's risky, but you should not take risks that you cannot overlook and you, that risks that you cannot evaluate. That is my point on risk taking. That's that's really, really interesting. And now that you mentioned the cultures, actually one of the questions that I had for you is that, for example, you talk about the idea of developing a conceptual, an entrepreneurial design, like you just said, uh, working on the concept specifically, but then like taking time and develop a good concept. But on the other side, for example, we have Facebook a few years ago with the build fast and break things, which are definitely two very different approaches. Yes. Uh, Do you think that's a matter of culture? Um, not if it's about technology. If you are in certain technologies, you have to be the first mover. If you create a new platform, you have to try to be the biggest platform because the second biggest or third biggest um, is not attractive anymore. You have to be the number one. In such cases, you really have to be very fast. No question about that. But most of the founders that I know are not in this kind of field of new technology. If uh, you are somehow in food or in um, all kinds of products and uh, uh, 
So you can, you should take time and find out what is the really best product, what is the state of the art of that quality, what is the state of the art of producing it, uh, there's things like that. So uh, there are f cases where you need to be fast, of course, and most people talk about these cases, but the majority of cases that I know are not so much about uh, speed, but about a good preparation. Of course, you can start with a poor concept. And uh, if you have enough money, I know there are examples like that with a poor, con or let's say, second quality concept. Uh, you can be successful. I, uh, I uh, used the kind of uh, picture saying, you can even move a dead horse. If you have four strong people, they can pick up the dead horse and move it. Or better, if you have a lot of money, you put the horse on a Porsche car and the horse becomes very fast. Yes, you can do that. <laughs> but is it economical? <laughs> is it a good uh, way to use money? I say no. You better start with a good concept, not with a dead horse or a second quality horse. St try to get a horse that can do races well. So uh, uh, create a, uh, what is it, race horse. Um, and you can, we have good brains and we are young and we are in a society which has good access to knowledge and a great university research. research. So we have all uh, things in place to create good concepts. Why start with a second uh, rank concept or with a poor concept? It's better to start with a number one concept. That's why I say work on the concept, emphasize on the concept, specialize on your concept, become the expert on that concept. Don't waste time. I don't say uh, be, uh, yeah, don't waste time, but uh, 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 go uh, into the race well prepared. Take some time for very good preparation. Don't waste time, but prepare yourself very well. That is my conviction. Mm -hmm. Okay, one thing that we already touched upon this, but is, for example, let's say we mentioned already Elon Musk. We can argue that Elon Musk is spread out too thin right now, but for example, what you you talk about getting a good concept and entrepreneurs as an as artists, and is my I believe that entrepreneurs and once again, correct me if I'm wrong, but. I truly understand that an artist is someone who creates continuously. How can you leverage the idea that someone who might be having 17 different ideas, how do you usually measure which ideas to follow, which ideas to go through? And this is point number one. And point number two, how do you define specifically, how do you get the best concepts? How do you What kind of skills do you think are important for you to build a good concept and get better ideas? What I recommend to my students is uh, don't work on one idea only. Work on five ideas or ten ideas and collect and uh, talk to others and find out and read and do research and uh, do as much as you can to develop your ideas. You know, there's something like idea creation, there's something like idea development, And there's something like idea refinement. So the process to get to a good business model is not just I have an idea and I start, but uh, you have to work on this idea. I think so far we are probably the same opinion. And the question is, what is a good idea? I, I uh, think people will find out, first of all, uh, where is the idea most convincing? And um, if I start with 10 ideas and I collect uh, from idea, uh, from the from first uh, uh, moment, uh, from the first uh, uh, dream or whatever, uh, how can I get to something substantial? I fully agree it's about uh, making money in the market. It's not about an artist with great, uh, Uh, concepts, but uh, you have to put it in the market and it must work in the market. So uh, the moment you collect uh, and research and collect uh, uh, like in a puzzle the pieces to make the 
business model uh, full blown uh, concept uh, you you need to collect a lot of things you need to go deeply into uh, researching uh, in in google or at the university or whatever so finally it becomes clear which of your five or ten ideas is the most promising and if that is not clear cut go out and talk to potential customers then it becomes more clear and so uh, it's a way i think um there is no uh, recipe to say uh, these are five points that makes it clear this is a number one idea but you of course there's some intuition and some you may like ideas more than others but actually if you have competing ideas it becomes clear after a while which one is the most promising and then uh, go to start don't wait go to start if you have good preparations go out and go for the proof of concept go for the proof of concept stay lean until you have the proof of concept and stay simple complicated matters are the are the devil it's the enemy of the founder if you start to be the too complex kind of thing later if you have some base and uh, the customer and basically the company works well then you can become more sophisticated more variations more complex but in the beginning keep it lean because you may to change you may have to change direction so keep it lean and keep it simple in the beginning later you can become more sophisticated and yeah keep it uh, in a way that you can change direction whenever you face resistance that the customer say yes may be a good idea but i wouldn't buy your product or it's far too expensive or i don't like it it may be a good idea but if i look at it i don't like it so go for customers uh i was with Jeffrey Timmons in Babson in the beginning of the 90s who is regarded as the uh, inventor of the business plan and business plan after him became famous and everybody talks about the business plan and he said that the customer is more important than the business plan if you have a customer talk to the uh, uh, customer and continue writing your business plan later i think that's good the customer is the decisive you have to get customers that pay the money for your product so that is makes the difference to the artist the artist doesn't go out and ask yeah, do you like my picture he loves his picture whether the uh, clients like it or not but the entrepreneur must work. is would you buy yeah, the picture yeah. the entrepreneur wants his picture to be bought by the customers and for a reasonable price so he makes good money that's a different to different to the artist but in some way he is an artist to create something new if you are not new all the ones who are in the market already all the established people have advantages over you they have their customers they have some kind of financial backing uh, they have money made uh, money already and have made all the mistakes have that are behind the, the failures and so on so you have to have something better and remarkably better than what is already existent in the market that is my uh, mantra you have to be better you have to be an innovator if not those established in the market have a clear cut advantage over you interesting and one of the things that actually one of the quotes that i that i saved from your book was that the quality of an idea or actually the quality of uh, an invention does not matter as much as the market's acceptance. It might be a very bad invention, but as long as the market accepts it, makes it a better invention than the other one. Uh, finally, yes. Finally, yes. At the same time, I believe as, as an entrepreneur, you have a chance to offer your, to offer your product. It's not that your customers are quite often uh, conservative they believe in things that they know already as an entrepreneur you have a chance to create something new and show your alternative uh, seeing is believing uh, show your alternative and uh, that's an uh, yeah 
uh, you need not stick to the conservative uh, conservativeness of customers. But at the same time, if you cannot convince the customer to stick to your new idea and your new product, you fail. So it's a balance. But uh, basically, there's a chance to outshine the uh, competitors by creating something new. But it must be a good concept. It must be something that is well thought through. If not, uh, you may fail. The Americans say, fail, stand up again, fail again, stand up again, and finally, the, the third approach, so you will be very successful. That is American style. That is uh, Silicon Valley style. <laughs> that is not what I... In Germany, if you fail, or in Europe, if you fail, that has a lot of uh, scars, that makes a lot of uh, yeah, scars, and you will not get up so easily again. And if you fail a second time, I would say for 95% of people, that was it. That's what was it. So they will not stand up so quickly. This is a different culture. America is a pioneer's culture. And here we have uh, more uh, people believe in the state and believe in all kind of big companies and lifetime tenure and uh, uh, good employment and uh, yes, things like that. So you have a harder time if you come in, into Europe with American style of entrepreneurship. You have to adapt somehow to the local style. Uh, the, as the saying is, uh, if you are in Rome, uh, do as the Romans do. Uh, if you are in America, do as the Americans do. Yes. But do you think... That okay. One one part is: Do you think that there's a value to the American style and a value to the European, or do you think that we should adapt to one of those? I think there's value in both uh, of the approaches. I admire the American approach, taking up a very high risk and not bothering about failure. That's great, but it does not work that easily in Europe. Not at all. So for Europeans, I advise them to be better prepared to look for a reaction of the media, uh, to <clears throat> talk to your friends and relatives and everybody, and make sure that you have the backing. If you fail, it is you, your fall is deeper than in America. So uh, it's like a mountaineer on a very steep mountain. Uh, the risk is higher, and you may not stand up again if, after you fall down the steep mountain. Hmm. One of, one of the things that you also mentioned during the book and that I, it reminded me of another book that I read. It's the, that creative, creativity, sometimes it's people, people think that it's one fantastic idea that came from one moment, but you argue, argue that's actually the opposite. It's the deliberative, systematic approach to getting more and more ideas. Exactly. And that reminds me of a book. I don't know if you've read it, uh, the book Originals by Adam Grant. I don't know that book. I have read a lot of books, but I don't know. Uh, I don't know. That. <laughs> um, you are right. Uh, creativity for some people means a lot of fantasy, fantastic kind of ideas, but not uh, down to earth. I am very much down to earth. So when I talk about creativity, uh, it's from the bottom. Um, from a bottom view and from a very realistic view. I always have in mind the customers. And so uh, creativity is something to make the better products in the market, make it more ecological, make it more, uh, make it uh, cheaper if you can, make it more durable, uh, take something that creates sympathy for you, creates authenticity that you can be the person you would like to be, things like that. And uh, mm -hmm. take risks that if you fail, it is not falling so deeply. Um, of course, there's always a risk of failing. And statistics says 80% of startups fail. And in the high tech sector, I was recently in Tel Aviv. They have a very vivid, lively mm -hmm. startup scene. And they said, no, 80% is not right. It's 90% that fail. So we should not take failures so easily. The Americans take failure a bit of 
on the easy side. So I know everybody, mm -hmm. in, even in Europe, talks about we need a failure culture. We need a culture that you can fail and uh, use it as an experience and stand up again. That is true. I wish we would have this failure culture, but we don't have it. That's a problem. We have laws for bankruptcy and so that really uh, are scaring and make scars on you. So I always advise don't take failure so easily. Bankruptcy is not something, a uh, simple thing. Um, I wish we would have more of this failure culture, yes, but we don't have it and I don't see that it will be created so quickly in our culture here in Europe. So work on the concept, hmm. work on the idea, yes. And how do you think that we can eventually, I mean, I think that probably might now might be too late for the people already doing entrepreneurship, but for the future entrepreneurs, do you think that there's a way of indoctrinating a better failure culture or you think that's too late already or too no, hard rather? I agree that we need a failure culture and we should do everything to uh, create it, but it's not in our own hands. There are other uh, institutions like law uh, that is not uh, changed so easily, at least not in, in countries like Germany or France or Italy. So, um, uh, of course, entrepreneurship needs a culture that uh, permits failure. There's no question about that. But on the same uh, side, uh, you have to be careful not to uh, take a risk that you cannot handle. That is my point. And uh, you cannot talk about risk without taking into account the environment, the environment of your people, the environment of law, the environment of financial institutions. They are different in Europe than they are in America. So um, you have to take that in account, particularly so if you want to be realistic and not in the clouds or somewhere. Mm, okay. Yeah, that's definitely it. I think that this is a very refreshing view for people who are indoctrinated within the Silicon Valley US way of building things. And I think this, this is even valuable for American people that might be already in the failure system that they might have. But having a different approach might be interesting in a different way of looking at things. And I think that you provide a very refreshing way of seeing things which i like i said i think i find it re really really refreshing uh, one one other thing that i would like to ask you is that and this is for a per, as a personal interest you talk about the idea of serial entrepreneurs and we already mentioned uh, the difference between uh, entrepreneurship and managing a few minutes ago but when you talk about serial entrepreneurs it you, you basically say that the more companies you found or you fund or found, the more easy it becomes, the easier it becomes for you to create new companies, correct? Yes, but serial entrepreneur is a proof that you have to apply division of labor. Uh, uh, Holger Jonsen, who is a, a student, or was a student of mine, and he created uh, ABO, a kind of secretarial services provider. Uh, he uh, had up to 30 different companies at the same time. So you cannot manage 30 companies. It's impossible. You get to the uh, psychiatric clinic if you do that. Um, you have mm -hmm. to find a way that you delegate uh, management functions. And uh, th so the more often you have founded a company, and I was within a dozen of companies, not 30, as Holger but uh, even with a dozen of companies, you cannot manage them. You have to have people who uh, stick with your idea or debate the idea with you, but take over the management. Maybe not 100% of the management. Maybe you keep some parts for yourself, but uh, uh, you have to uh, use uh, components. You have to use delegations. And uh, you, if you create your brain children, I, I like to call them brain children. It's children, but not uh, physically uh, living 
uh, children, uh, but uh, those mm-hmm. created by your brains, which is particularly interesting for us when we are men. So these brain children, they need guidance, but you need not manage them all the time. Mm-hmm. Parents do very well if they do not manage their children all the time and give them some space and involve other people. There's a saying, to raise a child, it needs a village, not just the parents. So, and to raise a company, it needs more than the founder. The founder gives the idea, it's the, the brainchild, but then is more necessary than mm. the founder. And a, a lot of people, they are good in founding, but they are not good in managing. But the question, the, the, the main thing that it comes from here is that there's a need to be organizational structure, that there's an organizational and economic structure that you have to be able to, to sell. For example, let's let's assume that we're talking about you and me. I create a company and I ask you to manage and let's assume you have the time. There has to be a very big financial counterpart for you to be able to accept it. And if you're managing the day-to-day operations and if you're doing almost as a CEO, what's the financial counterpart for me as a founder, but hardly ever is focused on that company because now I've founded 30 more companies. What? How do I sell an idea that I'm the founder, but you're the executive, you're the manager? How do I sell this to someone else? They might say, well, if you're not going to put any effort on this, I might build a company myself and screw you because you're not going to do anything. Actually, there are, let's put it from that uh, point of view. Uh, I don't think there are many people who are at the same time very creative and put a good concept together and are good managers. I really know people like that. Um, there may be people who are good in creating a concept and there are people who are good in uh, managing the day-to-day operations. I would never accept uh, 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 somebody who is financing me, uh, who wants me to uh, manage the day-to-day operations. I would not accept that. I would better stick with less money and bootstrapping and so on, but I would never accept the financing that says you must uh, stay at the company and manage it. Because I have a lot of ideas and I want to, uh, my strength is more on creating good concepts, not in managing. So I would not want to be vindicated by somebody who says, I give you money, but only under the condition that you stay there and manage it. I would not accept that deal. Okay. And so, and let me put it this way. Is there a way... And this is, once again, personally cu- personal curiosity, but do you think that there is a way, for example, for me to be able to create almost, I know that there's this name, the startup studio, but do you think it's possible for me to be able to capitalize on my ideas and simply just start hiring other people to manage it? But the thing is, for me to be able to do that, I have to have already a lot of money with me to be able to hire other people, No. Or the, yeah, you need to hire good people, professional people, and they certainly are costly, but that is not, we are not talking about millions. And if you have a good concept, for me, a good concept is one that you have a model how to create money. Um, so uh, I'm not one who says you have to uh, uh, work for three years and hopefully we find a business model that creates money. Uh, for me, a good concept is that It creates money as early as possible. So the management should be financed by the development of the company, company and the turnovers and the margin. So I'm in this point, I'm more on the conservative side, uh, not to creating things with huge financing and huge valuations and uh, no, no uh, profits inside. Um, If you have a, a really good concept, that uh, part of that should be that money comes in soon, that profits, surpluses come in soon. So uh, the problem of financing, if you uh, go as a serial entrepreneur, uh, you have to have concepts that are financing themselves uh, at an early stage, not in three years later or 
uh, even aid. You create companies that you have not an idea for uh, how the money comes in. Uh, scaling is not the only uh, thing to think of. I, I, um, I'm maybe more conservative in this aspect. I want to see surplus as soon as possible. Then I'm on the safe side. Mm, okay. I think that's a very, very, very interesting thing. But once again, uh, one can argue, let's assume, for example, that once again, I want to build a company. And I think that I see myself as the entrepreneur, not necessarily the artist. Uh, uh, rather, uh, as an entrepreneur, artist, but not necessarily as a manager. So let's assume I create a company. It has to make money right away for me to be able to hire someone. Yes. Right? And of course, you have to direct him. So, of course, you have to be in constant contact with him. Let's say an hour a day or so. Yes. But not eight hours or 10 hours or 14 hours. I don't believe in this kind of approach. But for me to be able to hire that person, I already have to have a proof that I can hire him. So in the beginning, I must be an artist that manages even, when we say beginning, let's say what, one year? Um, I would uh, put like this, a good concept must convince the manager that he is in an excellent uh, choice to work with you. The concept must be, of course, something that not only attracts customers, which is a necessity, but it also should attract uh, good people to work with you. That they say, oh, this is a concept, this is a person, the founder, and this concept is something I may become very famous and very rich. And I would like to work with this company, even if the payment in the beginning is not very good. That is very often the case that the payments in the first one, two, three years is not very good, but it's a promising company and you may give them a, a share in your company and people say, wow, share or an option. And this is such a good concept. I like to work. I put all my qualifications into this one race. Mm. That, that, I think that's brilliant. I th once again, that's something that once it's very refreshing. It's not something that you hear every day, if at all, because it's literally something that you hear and you look at Elon Musk and basically he has Tesla. He has the boring company. At one point he has SpaceX, of course. At one point he was also the chairman of Solar City until Tesla bought it. But at the same time, when he d gets an interview, he doesn't say he manages the day to day. He has some ideas. Of course, he's there every day, either doing design or something else. But at the same time, he says that he's an engineer. He's the creator. Actually, maybe there's a misunderstanding. I do not talk about absent, uh, to be absent, absentism or whatever you call it. I talk about not to get under, to get too much involved into management. Of course, as a founder, you are the person who, who is the head and the brain and the one who directs and gives the advice and everything. But it's not a, a eight hours or 12 hours management job. You are the leader. And let's talk about leadership. Maybe it becomes clear, uh, clearer if we call it entrepreneurship is more the leadership and management is more the day to day operations. So it needs leadership. Without leadership, the company is not going to do well. But leadership doesn't mean you go on a sailing boat and go somewhere else and think it over. But leadership means you are present, but you are not in the eight hours, uh, nine to five or whatever. Uh, you are the leader. It's about leadership. You have to give the uh, decisions and you have to make good decisions and you have to have a real overview over the market, competitors, technology, everything. And uh, that is time consuming as well. Uh, I wonder how people can be good leaders and at the same time can be good managers. I question that this is a good solution to be both. I think uh, you need somebody who is more on the leadership side and somebody who is uh, more on the management side to claim that you have to do both if it ends up in either leadership is not as good or management is not as good. I uh, pledge, I, I pledge for division of labor. We are in a modern society without division mm -hmm. of labor, you cannot work anymore. I love that idea. Okay. 
now I would like to jump into the the company that you built, uh, the, the main one, the yes, T yes. campaign. Uh, so can you can you say how that was? Can you explain how you built that? What was the idea behind? How did you get the idea? I was looking into different fields, and what, uh, to cut a long story short, I found that in tea business, in German tea business, it's an amazing situation. Uh, because tea prices were very high at the time that I founded the company in 1985. And I was traveling a lot. I was in India and many countries. And if you go to the source, you see that tea is sold in Germany at about 10 times higher than as you buy it at the tea garden. And the interesting point mm -hmm. is that tea is a finished product. You need not do anything. You just need to package it. That's different from coffee. Coffee, you have to roast it, you have to grind it, you have to put it in vacuum packages. There's a lot of things you have to do. But in tea, it's a final product. Nothing to do, just packaging. You know, packaging is not so difficult. And that really mm -hmm. you should outsource and not do yourself and have a modern machinery to do that. So. I, I, it came to my mind, so why is it 10 times uh, more expensive? Why not buy the tea directly in the tea garden and sell it yourself? The point is the customers want a variety of, they want choice, they want a variety of teas to be offered. And if you need to offer a variety of teas, you cannot import yourself all the teas. And you will easily find out for importation you need to buy a container load of tea and not uh, 10 kgs or 20 kgs. So container load of tea is seven tons. So if you want to have a good tea shop, as it was the convention that the tea is sold in tea shops, they have 50 varieties or even 100 yeah. or some have 300 varieties. So if you multiply that by seven tons, you have huge warehouses, you have towns of warehouses and one small tea shop. So you cannot do it like that. That is why tea, shop, tea uh, business is something like retail and the retailer buys from the wholesaler, like say five kgs per variety or 10 kgs per variety and the wholesaler buys from the importer which is on a pallet and maybe something like 150 kgs and the importer pay, uh, buys from the exporter by container load, seven tons or eight tons of tea. So that was the system mm -hmm. of tea trade that I experienced when I studied it. And I found, okay, what can be done is specialize on uh, one variety of tea only, take the best one in the market. And I had to did some research, what is worldwide regarded as the best tea? That's the tea from the Himalayas because it's the highest altitude, very steep mountains, very intensive sun and a winter break. And that is uh, only common to these Himalayas, high altitude teas. So I specialized on these teas, Darjeeling. And within Darjeeling, there's a certain harvest that is regarded as the best one. That is the harvest after the a winter break that is called first flush. So I started with first flush, a very expensive tea, very mm -hmm. expensive tea in all the tea shops, but because I could import it directly from the tea garden, or at least in the beginning, we had somebody who helped us by that, but uh, more or less direct, let's say like that. So I could uh, circumvent all the uh, intermediaries and uh, that made a big difference. And the second thing that I did is uh, big packets. Tea was sold in small packets, like 100 grams or 50 grams. And I said, look, you get a great tea, you get a great price, buy the whole uh, amount for one year. Store the tea yourself with a one kg, one kg, thousand grams package, and we give you an excellent price. Mm -hmm. And our price was one third of the common price in the market, imagine one third, so two thirds cheaper than the market. So what happened, the people queued to buy our tea. So there was no need for marketing or anything. It spread like hell that you get an excellent tea much cheaper than anywhere else, but you have to buy it in big packets like one kg and you can uh, 
uh, bring it the whole year, but it's an excellent opportunity. That was the start, and it was uh, it was uh, a successful from the beginning, and it was viable from the beginning. Even when we saw that the people queue up, we demanded that they pay in advance. It, it, we only took offers by mail or telephone when the people sent a check first. At that time, people worked with checks. So uh, we, <laughs> we were very liquid. We could have founded a bank because we had the checks, uh, checks before we uh, delivered the tea. It was great. And to pay for the tea as an importer, you have 60 days uh, for the payment. The, the tea arrives after 30 days, takes some time for the ship to come from Calcutta to Berlin, to Hamburg, Berlin. And so you have another 30 days that you can sell the tea already. So we had no problem with financing. In contrary, we were always very liquid. So that is a good concept that solves the problem of what is unique uh, selling proposition, uh, excellent price, number one tea in the world, and um, something strange, because we were not an ordinary t-shirt, we were a group of uh, university students with a, a professor. Uh, so we got attention, uh -huh. a professor suddenly found in a company, can he do that? German professors were not uh, well known at all for doing good business. They were well known for ivory tower and very abstract and theoretical uh, lecturing. So we had on positive, uh, points on our side, good price, high quality, people queuing up, uh, we had to pay after we got the money first, and so on. So uh, it would be difficult to fail with such a concept. And from this uh, beginning, it may be understandable, you may understand that from this beginning I got to a certain understanding of entrepreneurship that is different from the mainstream. If you have a really great concept, it works by itself. And there's no point of financing or no point of uh, advertising and no point of management. Somehow the students manage themselves and later I got a good manager who really did his job very well. But of course in, in constant uh, uh, communication with me as the leader. Mm -hmm. So this example may show, or this brainchild of mine may explain why I come to this maybe not mainstream uh, uh, beliefs on how entrepreneurship could be done and without risk or without not so much risk and without uh, leaning too much on uh, execution. Uh, I know that a lot of people say the idea is uh, second uh, 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 importance. The uh, big importance is about execution. It's execution that matters. And I believe, no, the concept is what matters. And execution follows. Uh, of course, we, we talked about that in the beginning. Even a second rank or third great idea with good management can succeed. But why not take a number one idea? Why not take the number one uh, concept and get it into the race? I believe that it makes sense economically to get the number one uh, to, to, to work with. <laughs> it does make a lot of sense, for sure. Uh, so, Professor, one, one last question before we go into the, the, the lightning round. Um, you have a lot of knowledge in all of this, but you are not, I think, like you said in the book, you are not very particularly passionate about tea, Yes, correct? I was passionate for the concept. I was passionate for the uh, for entrepreneurship. I was a lay, a, what is a layman? I was a, really not a professional at all about tea. I became, after 30 years, you can put me to every tea trader or every tea expert and I can debate with them. That is after 30 years. Of course, you become an expert later on, but in the beginning, I didn't know much. I, I found out it's Star Chilling First Flush, that's the number one tea, and I found out that I can make it much cheaper and at the same time earn money. So that was my uh, advantage. I was not a tea expert, not at all. 
Okay, well, Professor, this has been a fantastic conversation. I would just like now to jump into the lightning round. It's really simple. I'll ask you six questions, and for each question, you only have one minute to answer. Is that okay? Okay, tell me one to three books that have impacted you the most. Uh, Schumpeter. Uh, he, uh, he was the one who invented the uh, uh, figure of entrepreneur, and he laid the groundwork. Uh, next one is uh, yeah, not so easy to answer. Um, uh, Kenneth Galbraith, The Arrogance of Power. Uh, to, uh, to put something against these big concerns, these big companies like United, uh, United States Steel and that were the IBM and so on. And another one, uh, I would say Lean Startup. Ah, uh, uh, no, no, uh, Kawasaki. Lean mm -hmm. Startup would be number four, Eric Ries. No, Guy Kawasaki. Uh, when I got that book, I was really excited. The, the art of the start and the art of the start, something like artist. Mm -hmm. The art of the start. That was a brilliant mm -hmm. book. I liked it very much. Uh, could you repeat the, the name of the first one? Uh, Sch it's called Joseph Schumpeter? Schumpeter. He was an Austrian economist. He's famous in the history of economists. He may not be so famous for uh, uh, startups and founders, but he is the one who laid the groundwork for entrepreneurship theory. And he says it's the entrepreneurs okay, with their creative destruction who shape a society, who shape economy, who shape a society, and who they are the, they, they are the ones uh, who uh, uh, get uh, innovation, bring innovation to life. Mm -hmm. Joseph. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you for reiterating that. Another question. Tell me something you've changed your opinion in the last six months. Ooh, um, I find the Silicon Valley uh, theory, the Silicon Valley, uh, call it dream theory, uh, call it ism, Silicon Valley ism, takes a bit too much attention. Uh, Silicon Valley is great, and I really admire these people, no question at all. But I am in Europe, and I feel as a European, and European means uh, we are not better than anything else, but European is the variety of landscapes, variety of art, variety of people, variety of coffees and all kinds of things. So variety, call it variety. Um, that's what I like. And uh, somehow Silicon Valley takes over, takes over the minds and the brains and uh, lectures the people how to do it. You have to take a risk. You have to believe in yourself. You have to stand up and you have to fight. And if you fail, stand up again. This kind of thing. Yes, it is one position. Yes. And it works well in, in, in America. And uh, really, I admire those people, but it's not the one that I appreciate so much for my own environment here in Europe. Do you actually live by any motto or life quote? Yeah, yeah. One that is very important for me is a Chinese philosopher, Confucius, 2,500 years ago. He uh, made a, mm -hmm. uh, a saying that is, if you do the work that you love, uh, then you never need to work again. Yes, something like that. Yeah, that is something great. And for entrepreneurs, so of course the market is decisive, but at the same time, the work must fit into your personal kind of uh, frame, in your, must fit with your personality. Okay. If I were to give you six months to prepare to do a TEDx talk, and it couldn't be on either economics, entrepreneurship, or tea, what would it be about? I would love to talk about art. I'm not good in, I'm not very knowledgeable in art, but I admire it. Uh, particularly if it is art that at the first uh, uh, moment, it uh, makes me uh, feel strange or um, I don't agree. But art opens the eyes, art opens the mind and it opens emotions and art is something great. I would love to talk about art even if I am not a, a knowledgeable people about that. 
Okay, one last question before we go on to the closing remarks. If you were living college today, what, what advice would you tell them? My advice would be go into the field of entrepreneurship, find out what really makes you passionate, uh, find out what you want to give to the world, find out what is where your capabilities are, where your strengths are and put it all together and work on a, a good concept and take a little bit of time. Don't go too fast. These questions, all these questions take time to come to good results, but go into the field of entrepreneurship and use everything that you can and uh, be uh, careful that it fits with your personality. Fantastic. Well, Professor, this has been one of my favorite episodes so far. I loved talking with you. You have a lot of things and a lot of experience to share. Where can people find more about you, eventually get in touch with you? I know that you have a very tight schedule usually, but where can people find more about Actually, you? Actually, we do. I created my own foundation for entrepreneurship to be independent and give some uh, space to the ideas that I am promoting and uh, the understanding of entrepreneurship as we talked about it. And we do a yearly mm -hmm. summit, entrepreneurship summit. This year it will be on the 6th and 7th October in Berlin at the free, famous Free University of Berlin. Mm -hmm. um, that is about thousand people, all entrepreneurs. The entrepreneurs come to us, not the bankers or the uh, advisors or consultants. Or so we are with the entrepreneurs sharing their knowledge. Mm -hmm. um, you find all the details on entrepreneurship.de. Um, mm -hmm. It's about uh, six keynotes of very uh, famous people like the one who wrote the book about blue ocean. Don't get in the wet ocean, try to go oh. blue ocean where the competition is not that hard and where it's easier to get to new ideas and other people uh, mm -hmm. with some emphasis on ecology, some emphasis on social entrepreneurship, but basically an exchange of founders among each other. There are thousands of tips and uh, little things that you can gain by that. Entrepreneurship.de, uh, Berlin, 6th to 7th of October, every year around that time. Mm -hmm. And yeah, yeah, it's a great, uh, uh, atmosphere, the people like it, um, uh, most people come back every year, um, that's something, <laughs> and not a big entrance fee for students is about uh, 60 uh, euros, so we are not the expensive ones, like in tea, we are very cheap, I want to have people <laughs> become entrepreneurs and not to spend so much money with it. So that is what I recommend. Of mm -hmm. course, I recommend our website, Entrepreneurship D. There were some courses for free. We worked with Google and did some comics on entrepreneurship so that it's not so lecturing mode. It's not so serious mode. It's more like uh, having fun with it, how to create ideas. We do a competition, an international competition that's called Citizen Entrepreneurship. Uh, citizen entrepreneurship means many more people to become entrepreneurs. There are so many problems that we have, climate change and uh, refugees and things like that. We need more entrepreneurs mm -hmm. who uh, try to solve social problems and social problems by means of entrepreneurship, by means of business mind, business minded, but put it into practice on social issues as well. Uh, entrepreneurial thinking uh, in a broader uh, kind of, of scaling and, and applying. So that is, mm, yeah, that is what I recommend. Uh, the uh, participation in the competition is for free, and uh, the mm -hmm. entrepreneurship uh, 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 website is for free, and all the materials. And last, we offer a kind of, we call it masterclass entrepreneurship. Uh, that is a course that lasts for one year from the summit, from one summit to the next summit. And that's uh, engaging mm -hmm. in uh, business models. We try to work hard on uh, creating good business models. That's a course with about 100 people. Mm -hmm. 
you could call it a, your entrepreneurship university, we call it uni, the entrepreneurship campus with that master class. Um, it starts after the 6th and 7th of October. Um, yeah, that's what, how to uh, connect with me. Um, and of course the books, mm -hmm. I think the communicating with the books is something more, uh, 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 how to say, go to in, in, in a, into a deeper understanding of the field. This kind of uh, uh, entrepreneurship for everyone, um, brains versus capital, things like that. Uh, that is, mm -hmm. I made it easy to read. I worked hard on it to make it easy to read. And yeah, that's what I recommend. It's a fantastic book. Just to be sure, uh, the courses that you mentioned are all in the, um, in the entrepreneurship.de. Yes, that's, you all find that under entrepreneurship.de. Um, it's uh, mainly in Berlin, but there are a lot of people from outside. You could follow most of the uh, offers by uh, uh, mail or by uh, looking into the website. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's something. But first of all, I would recommend join the summit. Join the summit. It's a good atmosphere. Mm -hmm. You get a lot of inspirations and, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, tell your people if you have an opportunity to come to Berlin, take that chance. And of course, mm -hmm. you can meet me there. It's you going to be a great event. How people can approach me. I will be there all the time and I will be open to lots of discussions mm -hmm. and talks and everything. One last question just about the courses that you mentioned. Are they in German or also they, they available are in English? In German and in English. And both, and the masterclass is basically in German, but um, the, the material mostly is in English. Okay, okay, fantastic. Well, dear Professor Gunther Fulton, it was a great, great pleasure to have you here. And I will for sure be at the, the summit and I'll hope to meet you there. And I hope to have anyone from our listeners being there as well and meeting you Thank and meeting you very me. Much. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure to talk to you. You uh, could get all the uh, little things that are important and usually that do not come to uh, the surface if you do not go deeply into those matters. You made an excellent interview. Thank you very much. No, thank you very Thanks. much. Have and a great see day. You at the summit. See you at the summit. Bye -bye. Professor, have a great day. Thank you so much for plugging into this episode. I truly hope you love this conversation as much as I did. Gunter Faltin is one of the most knowledgeable people I've had a chance to talk here on the Pioneer Show, and I hope you learned a lot. Don't forget to try and go to the event that is happening on the 6th and 7th of October, Entrepreneurship Summit, and meet him there. This and any other information that you might have missed will probably be linked up in the show notes. If you enjoyed this conversation, consider subscribing to make sure that this podcast grows and we can get some more people and help everyone be the pioneers of their lives and careers. Also, if there's any feedback that you might have for me, reach out on social media. A big thank you for Gunta for his time and also to Thibaut Fonlein, aka DJ Rodia, for the music of the Pioneers Show. So, 